We got the Christmas tree right here. Thank you for those of you who've sent your freight holiday ornaments so far. They look fantastic. For those of you who haven't, what's wrong with you? Front and center right here on What the Truck up until a uh, very What the Truck Christmas. So you got an office out there. You haven't sent us a holiday message. Or you haven't sent an ornament. What are you waiting for? Your boy Dooner's right here waiting for you. You can email them to me, tdooner at freightwaves.com. Give you the address right here at Freight. Alley. Now, last night, huge night, right? We've been waiting five years for this very event. The Tesla Semi being delivered for the first time ever. Let's take a look at some clips here. Elon Musk went out at the event in Nevada last night to Pepsi. Um, the atmosphere in the room, I got to say, it was a little weird. Elon seemed really frazzled. I don't know if it was because he was talking to monkeys the night before through his Neuralink or the fact that Pepsi PR was freaking out. Um, thankful that Yee was only drinking Yoo-Hoo when he was on Alex Jones, right? It had to be a lot of pressure on him putting this thing out here. But I have to say a few things. I had a lot of thoughts on this. Now, granted, we didn't get a ton of information on this truck. If you follow it, right, like this was not an event to sell to carriers at all. This was a marketing event. This was a retail event. This is to tell people it finally happened. And maybe it was a little pressured by Pepsi because you thought you would have seen a little bit more here. Like, for example, they've been touting this 500-mile drive single charge, which they showed in that video. A lot of the trip downhill, they did go up some on it. Big milestone. If you know the other battery electric trucks in this space, they range out at around 250 miles. But with a battery electric truck, you kind of have to keep about 25% of that battery unused for your journeys. That's what carriers are going to want. A lot of those 250-mile trucks not viable, even in Dre or regional. I know someone who got one of those Nikola traits. However, Tesla Semi, if this really does come out at 500, close to 500, and it's anywhere near that $180,000 they put out, this is a great solution for Dre and Regional. It's not OTR, though. A lot of Tesla fans, they think this is an OTR truck. Look inside that truck. We got that video. Roll that thing one more time. What do you got in there for a driver to live with, right? A coat hanger. He walks inside. He hangs up his coat on the rack. There's no sleeper in that truck. You're not taking that truck to a rest stop and sleeping in it. That said, Hey, congratulations to the Tesla Semi Engineering Team. If you follow the space, 500 miles is absolutely a breakthrough. It comes in the same week that Long Beach announced that they added two new public chargers. There's a lot of work in infrastructure that has to be done here. I think targeting the smaller hall in the beginning is a much better idea to begin with. Anyways, did you guys like it? Did you enjoy it? Let me know what you thought of that Tesla Semi. I know a lot of people are curious. Even the trucker haters that I know, they're still curious about that, uh, that Tesla Semi. Anyways, let's tip the band. we got a lot of great guests today. We're going to have NASA on the show. We're talking about their SWOT mission to map the world's water up from space. Really, really cool stuff with them. We're going to have the Redwood guys on. They have a shirt for charity. They're going to tell us what a freight god is. Is it me? I don't know. We're going to talk to Netrodyne. we got Convoy on this show. we got a whole lot to go through. So let's tip the band, and we'll get things started. Did you know AIT publishes a global market report every month? So if your business needs information about air and ocean trends, how about carrier updates, economic forecasts, North American trucking? They got that too. Customs clearance news, it's all there. You can get all that and more in Easy Digest overview. Best of all, it's free to download. Seen this economy? Free to download sounds good to your daddy over here. The next edition comes out December 7th at AITWorldwide.com. Now, let's bring on some guys from Redwood who are doing something for a great cause. Gentlemen, come on here. What's up, dudes? Hey, hello. Hey, thanks for having us on, Junior. What's going on, man? Who's, who's, who's leading this squad? Who do I got with me today? <laughs> well, I'm Wayne Ostrowski. Right, I'm wearing God. the Freak God t-shirt. All right, Freak yeah. God, you go first. That's cool. Hey, Junior. Yeah, thanks for having us on. I'm, I'm Wayne Ostrowskis. Uh, yep, this is the Freight God t-shirt that we talked about. Um, and yeah, we're really excited to share uh, information about Danny did charity today. Yes, yeah. sir. I got one right <laughs> here. And who's in your cohort? Uh, who's got the red sweater on today? That's right. What's going on, everyone? My name is James Jackson. Uh, over here, red, former team member of Freight Wave. Shout out to my guys at Sonar, too. So looking forward to seeing what we got today and telling y'all a little bit about Danny did. Nice. And that must be Mike right there in the nice wooden office. 
Yeah, and good morning, everybody. Thanks for having us on and for the opportunity to speak about the Redwood Games and our contributions that Danny did. Well, cool. So thanks who, for having us on. Who wants to tell us? Why, why did you guys send me this Freight God shirt? I think it's, it's fantastic, but I know there's a purpose behind it. Fill us in on Danny did. Yeah, yeah I can tell you about that. Oh. Yeah. Go ahead, James. So, so every year, Redwood picks the charity, and uh, we try to make this a, a pretty friendly competition, right? So we split it in, and we try to raise money um, through all types of things. So we'll split, a, split whole Redwood in about 20 teams. We have captains, and then we'll try to do a pie in the face. We'll try to do you know jousting tournaments, just all these creative ideas to get some money going. And so we we tried – this year, our fund is is the Danny Dead Foundation, and so we picked this out, and because it was founded by Chicagoans, uh, Mike Mike and Marion Stanton back in 2010, after the death of their four year old son Danny, the Danny Dead Foundation works towards its mission to prevent deaths uh, caused by seizures, with with a couple of main goals in mind: advancing public awareness of sudden sudden unexpected death and epilepsy, enhancing. Uh, education and disclosure between medical professionals and families affected by seizures, and and just really getting the mainstream out of, of, the, of the seizure detection uh, and prediction devices that may assist in preventing seizure-related deaths. James, um, it's a pretty thing. Go ahead. No, I think that's awesome. I got a question for you though. What is that uh, over your left shoulder, like hanging up on that over that door? Right here. Oh, right here. Yeah. That's uh. That's. That's one of our that's one of our sky pandas that we have. Um, it's a we're real big into goose hunting down here in Texas, so okay. how to, to, to put one up on the wall there? Okay, because one so. time I asked where they had some like sort of animal hanging from the wall, and the guy was like, "Yeah, it's a jackalope. I shot him last Easter." So I just had to find out. Wayne, freight god, why why freight god? Yeah, so you know. I've been in the industry for uh, this is my 11th year, and I think a lot of terms get thrown out. You know, we're talking about slang and freight, hustle and freight. I've heard freight God before, and I I've had the idea for a while. I thought it was uh, something that would connect the transportation industry folks. I thought everybody would get a kick out of it, and so I wanted to introduce it. And I thought no better way than to do so through the Redwood Games to support Danny Did Foundation. I love it, Mike. Tell me what's the Redwood Games before we let y'all go. Yeah, it's just uh, just representation representation of the Redwood culture, right? We want to give back to our community. Uh, we, you know, James touched on uh, the competition, uh, the teamwork. Uh, Twenty teams competing for a good cause just speaks to who Redwood is and, and and our our spirit of giving back. And it's been a great um, it's been a great competition. We've just re- exceeded a hundred thousand dollars, so that's a new goal for us. And again, we've been doing this for over ten years, and it's a great opportunity to give back to a great cause. Love it. I love it so much. So people who want to give back to this great cause, how do they go and support it? Um, tell me, James. Yeah, so we have a link. Um, there's a couple of ways to do it, actually. You can go to our Redwood LinkedIn page, or we can go to mysticfern.com, and there's a link right there. Click on there. It will direct you right to the page, and uh, we'll be, be able to Fill all of your online orders out, and uh, if you think you're a freight god, you need a shirt. <laughs> okay, well, hey guys, I really appreciate it. By the way, you probably see this Christmas tree in front of me. I've been out here soliciting all of you. You want your ornament on the tree? Only front and center on what the truck for the month of December. Send me a nice redwood ornament. I'll put it there. And also, December 16th, it's a very what the truck Christmas. We're playing holiday messages from across the logistics universe. NASA's on today, so we're going universal. We're going out of space. Might even have a message from the ISS. We'll see. But we need office messages. So you guys want to send a holiday cheer? Hey, shout out from Redwood. Shout out from the Freight Gods. Shout out from the people who make Freight happen. Have a happy holidays. Get that to me by December 14th. We'll get on the show 30 seconds or less. Will do. Thank you. Take care, guys. Appreciate Thank your time. You. Thank you. Thank you. Keep, keep doing the Lord's work out there, boys. All right, let's, look, let's talk to Kiana Van Ways. Did I get that right? Corporate Sustainability Analyst at Convoy. You were, did you uh, put on the Tesla event last night? Were you curious about the EV Semi? Very curious about the EV Semi. And also, I'm glad you showed the clip earlier. It was uh, pretty cool to see what the cab looks like inside. And Dooner, you nailed my name, so... Uh, Great work. <laughs> wow. You know, the easy ones are the ones I always screw up. So I, I got this one and I feel uh, <laughs> I feel good about it. Well, what is a sustain? Because I was looking at your background, right? And you were with like some outdoor companies and that kind of thing beforehand. What does a sustainability or a corporate sustainability analyst do at a place like Convoy? 
Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, my background was actually in outdoor sports industry, and that's really what drew me to Seattle to be able to have access to our great recreation out here. Um, And so, yeah, most recently I was at Brooks Running for over five years where I was helping to build out their climate action program, you know, setting their com- the company's first science-based targets, uh, managing carbon accounting, um, and then helping to create programs to actually help achieve those carbon reductions and developing methodologies to account for that. Um, and then at Convoy, um, what it means, f- uh, a sustainability analyst at Convoy, um, so Convoy really is a mission-driven company uh, aiming to transport the world with endless capacity and zero waste, And so this really means that sustainability is embedded to everyone's role at Convoy. Um, It's not just a siloed job on a single team. And so what I love most about my role as a sustainability analyst is I get to act as an internal consultant on initiatives, both to reduce carbon emissions in our own operations and in our shippers' logistics supply chains. Um, And in addition, uh, what we'll be talking about today is I get to do our corporate sustainability reporting and then our semi-annual surveys to capture yeah. insights well, uh, from carriers and shippers. Let's get into that, Kiana. Come on. Yeah. What are we waiting for? But before we do, I always want to know the methodology because stats, data is, is nothing without all that stuff. So who do you talk to for these kind of things and what do you hope to accomplish by it? Yeah. So um, actually to do this, we speak directly to our carriers to understand their perceptions um, of ranging from a quite a few different topics. So we kind of identify some topics to measure over time, uh, and then some new topics that we know that are coming up with governmental regulations, um, and then understanding the barriers that truck drivers face when it comes to incorporating sustainability into their business. Um, And we actually get incredible engagement in this survey. Um, We did the survey in early September of 2022, and almost 600 mid and small size trucking companies participated. And this range from dispatchers, drivers, to owner-operators. Um. Wow. So, you know, it's interesting because I've been, this whole year, I've been going to see electric trucks, you know? So it's been very much top of mind. Every time I ask the founders and CEOs of these companies about the electric truck, and I talk about the markets that they're trying to sell into, they say the big push is really coming from the shippers. And you got me curious. Has that changed at all? Have you seen a change in carrier interest in sustainability from previous reports? Yeah, we've actually seen some um, super interesting results on this on this survey, um, and one that we thought was really interesting. And so we we do see it on the shipper side, a lot of pressure mounting as uh, our shippers have set some aggressive science based targets and net zero goals, and so they're looking to partner um, across their entire supply chain to reduce their carbon emissions. Um, but we're also seeing this on the carrier side. Uh, one key finding of the report were the personal motivations to drive pressures to reduce carbon emissions for carriers. Um, Carriers reported awareness of environmental impact of carbon emissions as a top reason for reducing carbon emissions. And this actually diverges from earlier this year uh, when we surveyed in March of 2022, where governmental regulations were cited as a top reason for reducing carbon emissions. And this was likely due to the SEC climate disclosure disclosure rule uh, being proposed at the time. So it was top of mind when the uh, carriers were taking this survey. Oh, wow. So how do alternative fuel trucks fit into the considerations that carriers are setting when they're thinking of purchasing a new truck? And again, it's very timely because that Pepsi event was last night. And I'm sure there were some that were like, hey, look, I'm seeing it. Some of these timelines, some are aggressive. Some are like 2030 at the ports in California. Yeah, uh, regionally, we definitely see some of those differences occur. And um, just across the entire network that we surveyed, um, this should come to at no surprise as a consideration for our carriers, um, but fuel economy, uh, top of mind uh, when it comes to deciding what to purchase for their next truck. In March of 2022, 82% of carriers listed this this as a top concern, and it kind of remained the same uh, for carriers in September of 2022. So really, a theme of 2022 is fuel uh, cost and economy. Um, And while we know that electric and hydrogen trucks play a vital role in decarbonizing the trucking industry, uh, there are still many challenges that need to be overcome to yeah. before we get to the widespread adoption needed in the early 2030, um, before 2030 to mitigate the worst impacts of climate change. 
Although, um, I, I got to say, you're probably excited to hear that Long Beach put in those two chargers, two free public chargers. So at least it's a start. We're up from zero. I know Baltimore has put in uh, a charger at their port. So it's early innings. You know, we're crying. You know, look, there's a reason why Tesla, for example, all these companies, they're not putting a ton of these out on the road. They're doing a specific thing with Pepsi because it'll be on dedicated routes and dedicated runs. We still got a ways to go, but it's really cool to see um, the interest growing in here. Now, what does that make you think? Does any, anything else surprise you or anything give you an idea of what the trend line will be moving into 2023? Absolutely. I think with some of the mounting regulations that have occurred in the past year with the SEC climate disclosure rule, which I spoke about earlier, and then the advanced clean trucks rule um, happening in uh, seven states have passed that. Um, And so we'll definitely continue to see a trend. And so we'll see some states start to adopt more um, favorable regulations um, in addition to the Inflation Reduction Act providing a ton of carrots for the infrastructure and the purchasing of electric vehicles. Um, one thing that actually surprised us from our survey um, is a common misperception that we hear from shippers increasingly that they perceive that carriers are not willing to provide information about their actual fuels, uh, um, their vehicles' fuel efficiency data to improve carbon emissions tracking. And we actually debunked this uh, myth that has been happening in uh, the industry. And we saw that carriers are actually willing to provide this data to understand emissions. So I think one thing that I'm excited to see in 2023 is really um, the coming together of both sides and um, using the insights from uh, each of our surveys that we do to start to bridge the gap and come up with common solutions to really uh, expedite. It's great to hear that the um, Baltimore and California ports are starting to put chargers in, but we're going to start to see those numbers increase. And it's great to see that um, it's it's already happening in late 2022. Yeah, look, and if you're a carrier dragging your feet, it doesn't mean you have to convert. There are timelines on these things, but you should really start getting aware of the space moving towards sustainability. The larger you are, the more pressure shippers are going to be putting on you. They put a lot this year, and I can imagine, as you know, they're going to put on even more next year, and that's only going to mount up. This isn't a category that's going away. It's only going to grow. Which I'm excited about. It's supposed to be the decade of action, so we're excited to see some climate action occur. Well, very cool. So people who want to follow up, they want to learn more about what Convoy is doing, or they want to check out this report we were talking about. Where do I send them to? Um, Yeah, head over to convoy.com. It's on our blog. We have the report. You can download it um, and access it from any um, any web device. So very cool. All right. Well, hey, thank you for coming on the show. We appreciate your time today. By the way, I have convoy ornaments on this tree, but they're from last year. So if you got a freshie, send them our way over here at Freight Alley. We'll get that tree all decorated. Okay. Have a great one. You too. Take care. Appreciate your time. All right. Meanwhile. Oh, look, he's so smart. He's going to eat. Look, he's using the car wash to clean himself off. I don't know if you guys have ever been to Costa Rica. I went there on my honeymoon, but there's stray dogs like everywhere. They're really nice. They come up to you. They're not aggressive or anything, but um, they're kind of integrated into society. They're like one of those cat cities, or at least they were where I was in uh, Porto de Lemon. And I think I saw a dog or two going over to the washing machine, but he's going to look uh, great for his date tonight. I don't know. Barrett Young, SVP of Marketing and Entertainment. That's not how you get ready before you come on What the Truck, is it? It is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how very common around here. I don't know how to say though. I was just looking at the dog and I'm like, that is still a machine. I hope it doesn't like just start spinning them around or something. But he was he was good. <laughs> Barry, you see the uh, you see the Tesla event last night, the semi event. Like that is like the the biggest news in in my world. Were you interested? Excited? I Thoughts? did. Uh, I think it's exciting. I mean, it's a fundamental shift in kind of how the industry is going. So I think it's very exciting. You, did you like the look of it all? One thing I was asking out of the drivers that work for me is I noticed something interesting about the truck is there's no driver side doors. Like you have to go behind you and go through that galley way to go out. So that might be a bit of a hassle when pulling up to a, a gate or a dock. I'm not even yeah. sure the window goes down. It is a little interesting. Um, I mean, I mean, you, the normal behavior and how you guys get in and out of a vehicle is going to be adjusting a little bit, but uh, I found it interesting. Obviously, I'm not a driver. I just know a lot about the industry, so I've not faced uh, um, sort of that in- issue just yet. But I think in general, the, the vehicle looks very cool. 
But you are interested in fleet safety, are you not? So all these things have to be taken into consideration. But most fleet safety problems don't have a problem with EVs right now because most fleets don't have EVs, but they do have trucks and there are issues. And what is upside down about them, though? I like this topic you sent me. What is wrong with these safety programs out there? Yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick you off with a, a powerful statement and, and hopefully it marinates for a second. But you know, the way we've been taught to do fleet safety is perfectly suited for a world that no longer exists. Okay. If you think about that for a second, right? It's heavy, right? Um, and that's what there's a fundamental shift happening in the industry, right? Previously, fleet safety programs were built off of triggered events, you know, the hard brake, the hard acceleration, the collision, or something like that. And then you bring your driver in and you talk through what went wrong. Um, that's no longer the case. Yes, that's an element of it, but a lot of it is is uh, is evolving. And what that happens is previous programs were only addressing half the problem. They're only speaking to the bad things that drivers do. Um, and so if you think about this from a psychological standpoint, you know, if my wife only spoke to me when I did something wrong, our conversations would always be negative, right? And it probably wouldn't be a very healthy relationship. But she's smart. She's like, you know what? You made the bed this morning. That's fantastic. Thank you for doing that. Made me feel really good. And now I'm more likely to come back and make the bed more often because I know that those endorphins were released. The other part of this is that we're only addressing um, uh, half of the coaching problem as well. We're only coaching on the bad stuff. And we're only coaching infrequently, once a month, once every couple of weeks or so. Um, and that's not able to be scalable in improving driver behavior. Interesting. You know, I talk to a lot of drivers and one of their concerns when it comes to safety is like in cab cameras, for example, comes up and drivers, you know, they they're like, they're just going to collect data on us. I don't want Big Brother spying on me. They're just going to have some manager reprimanding me nonstop. How do you change driver behavior to get more accepting and, and not have them consider this to be adversarial? 100 percent. And at first, I can understand exactly why drivers feel that way. But it's really just a viewpoint of it being more of a, a co-pilot or an in-cab coach. As you're going through and driving and you're encountering different scenarios on the road, it's great to have someone go, oh, hey, watch out for that. Oh, slow down really quick. Somebody's pulling out. That's all this is becoming. All of our safety cameras now, again, previous trigger-based events, uh, recording devices were very just like that. New advanced AI systems are able to, in real time, warn you or coach you through different scenarios on the road and obviously as more and more passenger vehicles are on the drive on the road more and more passenger vehicles are texting checking facebook heaven forbid they're not TikToking. um then it became an dangerous increasingly dangerous environment even for commercial drivers so this really needs to be viewed as hey we're here to help you we're helping to coach you in real time and prevent you from actually having accidents you know when you do see something that is coachable how do you and I understand that, like, just from being any type of manager, it really depends on the person you're approaching, how you use your language here. But in general, how do you approach someone to enact creative measures without getting them uh, corrective measures, without getting them defensive? All it comes down to is just flipping the script. Yeah. It's simple as that, right? And uh, a lot of it means that you have to recognize the good thing these drivers are doing as well. Think about it. 80, 90% of their day are all really good driving. You know, they're stopping at stop signs or maintaining following distances or speed limits or whatever like that. But the one time something goes wrong is the only time that a fleet manager comes in and talks to them or safety officer talks to them. If you can flip the script by saying, listen, I see all the great things you're doing. You stopped at, you know, 17 stop signs in a row. That's great. You didn't, you know, didn't roll through them. You've maintained your speed at 60, 70 miles an hour, whatever that threshold uh, is when you're on the interstate recognizing all the good things you're doing, going back to the example about me and my wife and I'm making the bed, if you reinforce all that positive behavior, then they're going to have a much better conversation with you. If you're, if you're only pointing out the bad things they're doing, then it's going to be that contentious relationship continuing over and over again. So it really just comes down to flipping the score up. Um, fleet managers themselves and even the drivers themselves, going back to the point just I mentioned, uh, don't fear new technology. The new technology is actually more advantageous. It's here to help you. Um, and I think that alone will really just make the relationship between the driver, the safety officer, and inside the vehicle much better. Well, let's say I'm watching this, and I'm, I'm not the safety manager. I'm the safety manager's boss. And now I'm, like, concerned if my program's not there. So how do I know if my safety manager is running this program good and creating the right culture? 
Yeah. So honestly, you'd be able to have a, you have to have a safety system that can actually see positive recognition. Otherwise, it's it's hearsay. Um, and so, first of all, make sure you're looking out for a safety system that can do that. Um, and then on top of that, when you begin flipping the script and having more conversations around with the good things you did, you can still address things that need to be improved. There's no doubt about that. You don't ignore when something was bad, but if you can start off with a positive, you know, address the negative and then maybe finish off with the positive, then that whole conversation is better. So make sure you're working with all of your safety officers, your safety coaches to, to how they can scale actual positive coaching as well. So make sure you have a system that can recognize that. But going off of also what I just mentioned about coaching, you have to have more frequent coaching. If you only talk to them once a month, first of all, the coaching that you did a month ago is probably forgotten at that point. You need to have much more frequent coaching. So expectations need to be set that, hey, we're going to come in, we're going to talk to you at least once a week or once every other week. Some people may say that's not scalable. I've got 75, 80 drivers. And I only have three safety offers. How am I going to do that? Or do I have to go hire a bunch of new people? Also, make sure you look for a safety system that does automated coaching or recommended coaching. We have a system called our Green Zone Score that helps actually prioritize which drivers you can go after or which drivers you should talk to first. Because you can see exactly who are underperforming and actually, more importantly, who your best drivers are. Go talk to those great drivers. Those are the ones you don't want to lose. So talk to them more, reward them, congratulate them, all the great things that they're doing. Talk to them like, hey, there's little things we can do here. Drivers want to be better. They, they're proud of their jobs. So, you know, talk to them about that. And it's great. So is it zero tolerance? Is it, you know, what is the tolerance level that you give here? And I, again, this depends on your program. But I know that's such like a delicate question for some people is, is how far do I take it or how iron is my fist? That's 100% up to the fleet. You know, as a, as a safety officer or a boss of a safety officer or the fleet itself, we have some fleets that, that use our, our system that say we have zero tolerance for phone usage in the vehicle while you're driving. If you were distracted and the system recognizes you're looking at your phone, zero tolerance. See you later. That's totally up to the fleet. And, and then part of having a safety system that can be customizable and, and have different thresholds like that and work with you is exactly what you need. Um, but yeah, totally up to the fleet how, how strict they want to be. Well, very cool, uh, Barrett. I appreciate it. People want to talk more about safety with you. Where do I send them to? Yeah, go check out netyourdying.com. Um, we've got a lot of really great resources there. Feel free to uh, peruse and go through all the different content have, uh, that we have. Um, check out you know, a quick demo. we got videos and things like that. It's a really powerful system. Um, you know, we're changing the way, making it way better and more safer roads out there. And Barrett, I, I don't see a Netrodine ornament on my tree, so if you guys want to get on top of that, I will put that on here as soon as we're, it arrives. We're working on it right now. I knew you were going to ask me. Yeah, we're working on it now. Look for it soon. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time today. Take care. Take care. Happy holidays. All right, XBO is driven to put your freight first. With coverage in 99% of U.S. zip codes as well as key routes in Mexico and Canada, XBO will help you get your shipments where they need to go on time and damage free all fine tuned by over 35 years of world-class LTL experience. Learn more at LTL solutions.xbo.com. And while you're there, check out that new commercial, like the cow and the bird. It's a good one. All right. Carrie Lewis, payload system engineer at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, is just about to join us. But before she does, let's give you a little video preview of what we're about to talk about. So for me, SWAT is water. SWAT is precision. In one word, I would describe SWAT as beautiful. SWAT stands for Surface Water and Ocean Topography. SWAT will be observing the elevation of water surface in the ocean, on the land. The water surface height will allow us to assess the water storage in lakes and stream flow of rivers. Our water is one of our precious resources. SWAT is unique because it is the first global view of our ever-changing water supply on Earth. SWAT's main instrument is called CAIRN, which is the K-Band Radar Interferometer. CAIRN is what sets apart SWAT from other missions. It's a unique instrument that we're flying for the first time. The CAIRN instrument uses the two antennas, which are spread out on either side of the spacecraft, in order to bounce signals off of both of those to get a much larger view of the surface and being able to do it in very high resolution, higher accuracy, and also a wide swath so that we're able to measure large tracks over the Earth in a relatively small amount of time. 
SWAT is a Pathfinder mission using new technology to address transformative questions on climate change and its impact on our environment. We're collaborating with CNES, the French Space Agency, for these programs, but we're also helping the global community to be able to contribute and collaborate towards making our home planet a better place. SWAT will make our models better, and our understanding the water budget helps us be able to steward that precious resource. If water is out of balance, we could face droughts, and it could also lead to floods. SWAT is going to be observing water in oceans, and ocean science is essential for understanding sea level rise and climate change. Now we are facing a time that we need to be very precise. Therefore, we can accurately predict what will happen in our coastal cities 50 years from now. Understanding that it is a finite source and we can't rely on that forever is something that's really important. I'm just so excited and can't wait to see how it impacts the lives of others. Without really understanding the Earth, we cannot protect it because we know that the missions that we work on are going to have an impact on our children and our grandchildren. Wow. Carrie, that is so cool. Um, Mapping the Earth's ocean surface, there are so many questions I have, but before I do that, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us. Thanks for having me today. Where are you hanging out? You're, you're one of those JPL uh, team members, aren't you? Yeah, I am at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is a NASA federally, federally funded research center in Pasadena, California. Ooh, what's it like in Pasadena today? I used to live out in SoCal. It is rainy which is oh. unusual for us, but very welcome. <sighs> Roads get slick out there, too. Well, rain, water, at least it's topical for what we're going with today. Um, you know what I find interesting about this? Usually when I'm talking to NASA, we're talking about missions that are look are pointing at Mars. You know, the lens is pointing mm -hmm. out, out at space or, or the moon. But this is an Earth-based mission, meaning you're setting something up to look back down at Earth. How many of NASA's missions are Earth-based like this? So there's about 80 active NASA missions going on right now, and a little over 20 of them are Earth-focused. Um, so about a quarter of all of our missions are based on better understanding our Earth. Interesting. So who comes up with a project like this? Who is like, we need to send this up here and we need to map the Earth's water and satellites is the way to do it. What's the whole thought process behind this? So usually it starts with the scientists who have questions that they need answered, right? They, they want to understand better how water flows over the Earth, and they can't do it with the current uh, satellites um, in orbit. And it's very difficult to monitor all of our many, many lakes and rivers and oceans um, using, you know, in situ um, local uh, systems. So then they start talking to the engineers, and the engineers say, well, what, you know, I could probably do this for you. And they, um, and it takes, you know, many years usually of back and forth between scientists and engineers coming up with concepts and then um, convincing NASA and Congress to pay for it is also because, you know, there's a lot of great ideas out there, a lot of uh, interesting science to be done. And uh, so I actually started working on SWAT, I believe, in 2011. And then left for six years and worked on another project and then came back. So it takes, you know, it took over a decade to get this project to where we are today. Wow. So this project, where is this project today? As I understand, it's just about to launch, right? Yes. Um, a little less than two weeks on December 15th, we'll launch at 3.46 a.m. out of Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. Oh, okay. So what goes into that? What happens here? Because I see payload in your name. And to me, payload is freight as well. And that thing looks like a big old piece of freight you got to put up in space. Yes, it's exactly. So for us, a payloads are instruments. And the spacecraft would be the truck. And and the launch vehicle concept, the whole spacecraft is the payload and the launch vehicle is the truck. So um, when we say payload engineer at JPL, we mean instruments. Um, but yes, the whole spacecraft is currently getting, um, put onto the top of a Falcon 9 rocket and then, um, yeah, then we'll take off from there. Very, very cool. Speaking of the Falcon 9, did you see the Tesla semi yesterday? Were you, were you excited about that coming out? 
I did not see that. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. It's a big breakthrough. And you guys, you guys are very busy. You have a launch in two weeks. I can understand why you're yes, not up watching it. I've been walk, um, working very long hours, but it's exciting, so it's worth it. What do we hope to learn? What don't we know about the Earth's water that we hope to know um, once this launches in a few weeks and you have some time to get some data? So we don't really have a global understanding of how water moves across the Earth. We've been doing ocean science um, from space for over 30 years, but it's been very difficult for us to um, have the instrumentation necessary to monitor lakes and rivers and the coastlines because of the precision needed to, uh, to detect a, a body of water that size from space. So um, what we hope to learn is how the water moves um, ac through, across the um, the surface, that's what we, when we talk about surface water, we're talking about, you know, over land and, um, you know, help us to predict floods, droughts, um, weather prediction, you know, all these things will come into play. And also, not only will we have more precise measurements of surface water, we'll actually have more precise measurements of the ocean. We'll actually be able to detect local ocean um, situations like eddies and fronts where, you know, you, you know, the, the sea is higher, it sees warmer, things that we haven't been able to detect before. You know, I noticed something interesting, too. This is in cooperation with France's space program. Is it not? World Cup topical a little bit here. Talk <laughs> yes, about the collaboration with, with France. How is that working out with USA and France right now? Uh, it's great. We've actually been partnering with them in this type of science since 1992 with the launch of a satellite called Topex Poseidon. Um, and we've been sharing scientific inquiry and engineering development with them for, and so this is just the next step. And really, you know, NASA partners with a lot of other international agencies, and it allows NASA to do more than we could do on our own because launching into space is very expensive. And, you know, combining our efforts with other people's efforts allow us to do more than we could do on our own. And that giant crate that we're looking at here is that that must be oh. the system right in that. There's a whole thing yeah, fit inside box. that. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's us all in, wrapped up in a box. It's what us, kind I of a, what are they what are they packing that in? How does that how do like sort of the logistics of packaging one of these things for flights work? Oh, it's very, very delicate. I mean, spacecraft, you know, they're built to sit on top of a launch vehicle. So, you know, they have to survive that. And that's a very harsh environment. So they aren't necessarily delicate, but you also don't want to accidentally bump into it or damage it or, you know, or, you know, um, hurt the surfaces of, of, especially of the instruments in any way. So you have to build a protective structure around it. And then that whole structure goes usually into another more sturdy, like, um, structure that you could put on the back of a, um, semi. And then that whole thing gets moved. We shipped this spacecraft from France to, um, California a couple months ago by actually driving an entire semi into the back of an airplane and flying the whole thing over. It was amazing. Oh, did you use that that big like beluga, the the weird looking airplane you guys have? Uh no, we used well, we used the Air Force C C five C five. Oh, okay. Airplane. I love yeah. that like weird beluga looking plane. It's it's one of the strangest yeah. things. I showed it to my eight year old the other day, and he was like, "That's a real plane." <laughs> I know, that's crazy. Absolutely. I was like, NASA moves gigantic things. I mean, have you seen have you seen their crawler? Um, so how long will this, so this launches, it goes up in space. How long does it fly around and how long does it need to um, assess? Or is this like a constantly ongoing thing that it'll be doing? So um, for the first six months after our launch, we'll spend time um, calibrating the instruments. This is the first time we've ever flown one of the instruments, the radiometer, which allows us, not the radio, <laughs> I'm sorry, the radar, which allows us to get the high definition precision that we need to get rivers and lakes and it'll take us about six months to work out um, exactly all the errors of the measurement. And then we'll have a three-year mission of constant 
on just taking data constantly. It just orbits and takes data um, continuously, and it um, repeats its orbit every 21 days. So we get a full map of the Earth every 21 days, and so we can, you know, follow seasonal um, changes in the water. There's been a lot of groundings in in ocean shipping with uh, giant vessels getting stuck in the ground, even some smaller ones. And some are due to drought, like the Mississippi. Some are due to weather and pilot error, like the Suez. But then there was the one off of Baltimore. They just ran into some water that was too shallow for the boat. Can this help anywhere here, telling depth around ports or channels or anything like that? Definitely. I mean, finally, with um, our the Karen instrument, we'll be able to detect coastline sea level, which we have not been able to do before. So we'll definitely be able so this, we expect the shipping industry to use the data that we provide to help prevent things like grounding. So do you have any presumptions of what you'll see or is that like the most anti-scientific thing you can do? <laughs> um, yeah, um, I mean, we ex- well, we, we've been looking, you know, at sort of a global level. We expect to see a more precise understanding of sea rise. Um, we expect to be able to um, determine how um, heat is absorbed into the ocean. We have theories that it's absorbed locally and these eddy currents that happen in the ocean, not like globally absorbed. And, but, you know, so we anticipate we'll see that, but until we actually get the data, we don't actually, you know, right now it's all theoretical. Yeah, no, it's so it's so cool. So in this system that we're looking at here, is that how it will look, I guess, when science is looking at it? Is that the, what the camera spits out, like the HD mapping? So what you're seeing is sort of an um, artistic rendition of how the radar works, which and it's an interferom- interferometric radar, which means it sends two signals at the same time looking at, and then as, a sp- as the spacecraft goes in its orbit, it you know, makes a line along the the surface of the earth. And those two signals get combined to become a very, very precise signal. Like when you have two cameras and you can get stereo by um, combining the two, you get 3D vision by having two cameras, you get a much better um, image using two radar signals at the same time. It's so cool. I like this thing a lot. Um, <laughs> anything else I, we should know about it that I that I haven't asked? You know more about this thing than I do. Yeah, um, I'm checking my notes. <laughs> um, uh, I think we've covered a lot. Um, well, how will this benefit us down here? Everyone wants to know that. How will this? Because a lot of NASA technology does rub off yeah. right down here on Earth. How's this going to help us here? Yeah. So we get to, uh, so this data is available to anyone who wants it. Um, all NASA data is publicly available. And we anticipate that lo- at both the global like weather services will use the data to help with weather um, models and prediction, but also at the local level, we anticipate people who are interested in managing water resources like reservoirs and engineers who design, you know, bridges to use this information to help understand the how water is flowing in the area that they're concerned with. Very, very cool. Now, Carrie, I just have a few curiosity questions before I let you go, and this is more general okay. NASA. The first one is, what is the most realistic NASA show or movie? What portrayal of NASA is the most, at least somewhat true to life? Okay. Um, none of them are that great. <laughs> <laughs> I would have to say, um, I would say the Martian does actually a really good job of going into the engineering. It's kind of fantastical that you could do as much as he did, but the actual engineering behind what he did is pretty well done. That one always gets the vote. That one always gets the nod when I ask uh, you NASA guys. But what is your favorite one? Just because it's realistic doesn't mean it's enjoyable. So what's your favorite NASA movie? Oh, I don't know. Um, Contact. Oh, yeah. Is a good one. Oh, Contact is really good. That's a nice pick. And I don't, you know, that one's kind of fu- like, cause that came out like 97. I don't know if people have heard about that as much. It kind of fell down the, uh, the wayside. If you're out there, you haven't seen contact, definitely check that one out. It's a gem. The other one is a lot of young people listen to the show, a lot of students and my own kids. Uh, so my question for you is how do you get your job with NASA? How do you get a job there? So, um, NASA recruits directly from universities. Um, that's probably a major way that we get most of the people, um, 
We recruit at all the major engineering universities. And, you know, you can also apply online. We all, we're hiring, we're hiring now. Um, so you can submit your resume that way. And I would encourage kids who want to work at NASA to come and are interested in working in NASA to, you know, some people just like, I want to work at NASA, but most people have an idea of like, oh, I want to be a scientist or an engineer and find the school that is already working with NASA in that area, apply to that school, or you can go to a school that is relatively close to the, the NASA center that you're interested in uh, working at. Um, California has a very good polytechnic school system, which I don't think people outside of California know about, but we hire a lot of our engineers from there because they're good engineers and they're local and we have access to them. So. No, that makes a lot of sense. That was really, tip. that was, that was, <laughs> those were super hot tips. And before I let you go, what has been your favorite NASA moment so far since you've been there? Oh, I, so there's many. So I think the most recent one was the video that we took of the landing of Perseverance on Mars. That was very thrilling. Um, I know personally many of the engineers who worked on it. And so it's, you know, and I, and so just being able to see the rover land on Mars real, you know, nearly real time was just, it was just incredible. That, that had to be. I mean, hey, congratulations to you and the team over at NASA. You have really accelerated your work, especially since you did that launch two years ago for the first time from U.S. surface uh, soil in almost a decade. And you know what? Considering the climate of the world right now, that is more important than ever. That's partnership mm -hmm. with, with SpaceX and what NASA is doing. And it's so cool to see our space program mm -hmm. back in full force doing partnerships with the French and all this stuff. I love to see it. Happy holidays to you and the NASA team. Thank you so much for coming on What the Truck. Thank you. Appreciate Happy holidays. Time. Take care. Good stuff. All right. Well, it is Friday, so let's go to a little good news, bad news. the bad news and good news. All right. Tanner, by the way, on number two, I think maybe we will play that full video. I'm not going to it yet. Just a little heads up in case you have that one. I'll give you a second here on topic one. All right. This one's really cool. Overdrive reports. Take a look at this couple right here. These guys are great. Overdrive reports for husband and wife team driver Deb Kingdon and uh, Ed Kingdon Jr. The opportunity to move the 2022 U.S. Capitol Christmas tree from Pisgah National Forest in North Carolina to Washington, D.C. is a career highlight, and it has to be. I mean, look, we saw Thomas Healy driving a tree through New York City. Look at this great couple here. They says right here, this is Ed. He says, when I retired from the military in 2018, Deb and I decided to begin our careers in something we could do together since our kids were grown. We love to travel the country and saw truck driving as a job we'd enjoy. Do we have a picture of the tree, too? Or maybe we should have three pics. No, maybe not. Um... Yeah, there we go. Doesn't it look fantastic? We'd love to travel the country and sock truck driving is a job we'd enjoy. Never in our wildest dreams do we think we'd be the ones responsible for delivering the U.S. Capitol Christmas tree to D.C. Christmas. It's such a special holiday to their family. So to have shared this experience with our kids and grandkids who visited the community celebrations as we made our way to the Capitol was truly memorable. This is really cool, too. So here's a big historic moment. It said it was an honor to be selected as one of the drivers to become the first Woman driver to all the U.S. Capitol Christmas tree. It was an experience of a lifetime. Hey, congratulations to you guys over Drive. Good job covering that story right there. Love to see trucking bring that tree to the Capitol. Now, you want to see something like really cool and cathartic? It's this guy backing up this giant truck. And originally I was like thinking maybe we should speed this up because it takes a minute. But I think maybe you got to watch the whole thing to appreciate it. So let's just get this tape rolling. Oh, no, we only got... Okay, we only got the speed up. We'll go with the sped up one here. Look at this guy though. He's got, what, three trailers I'm seeing over here? Backing this through the lot. I was asking Justin and uh, Rooster, Super Trucker and Rooster, about how challenging this would be. And they're like, awful. Like, this guy did amazing, amazing work doing this. And he said the one thing you can do as a uh, little trick here is follow the tire marks. You can see some on the ground. Um, as you can see, not an overly full lot, but definitely tons of obstacles you could hit. I saw those flagpoles in the background. We got these dumpsters over here. And, uh, yeah, what a great job by this guy. Fantastic stuff. 
And uh, we got one more story before I send you home. It's uh, We started this show with the uh, Pepsi semis. Let's see what's going on with the Coke semi. Going down the road. I don't know if this driver notices or he just does not want to abandon this road, this load. There's people on the streets desperately trying to drive this, stop this guy. He's driving the Coke truck. It's flaming out of the back. I believe this is in Romania. What, do they use real sugar over there? I know in like Jewish Coke, for example, like kosher Coke or Mexican Coke, you get the real sugar. I'm not sure about that one. I don't know what burns better. Also, you know what's kind of interesting? So I don't know if you guys follow Elon Musk at all on Twitter, but just a couple days ago, he posted that picture of his like bedside and he had the caffeine-free Diet Cokes. He had like three or four of those on his table next to a couple handguns. The funny, the funny part is that, like, <laughs> sorry, that was a couple days before this uh, the Pepsi delivery event, right? So he, he's out here strumping for Diet Coke, which I agree, Diet Coke is better than Diet Pepsi, but I'm not delivering 15 semi-trucks to him. So good on you, Elon. I thought that was funny stuff. Hey, Keyboard Cat, hit the music. We'll send everyone home for the weekend. In the meantime... Send us your ornaments over to the What the Truck Christmas Tree. Find me on Twitter at Timothy Dooner. That's D-O-O-N-E-R. Subscribe to this show wherever you get your podcasts or download the Freight Waves TV apps to see us in live and living color. Or go to YouTube, right? Subscribe on YouTube. That's how I watch all this stuff when I'm not walking around with other people's voices in my ears or my head. Hey, have a great weekend. Take care, everybody. Don't be a stranger. Peace and love.